So Jeff received his PhD in Ecology and Evolution at Stony Brook University in 1973, joined the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UC in Boulder in 1974. He regularly teaches large introductory courses in genetics and advanced genetics courses um, and has a genetics lab at CU that, uh, if some of you know Tanya Higgins um, in our community, she's a, a student of Jeff's. So without further ado, I want to bring up our main speaker, Professor Jeff Mitten. Okay, let's see if we can do this. It's good to be here. It's been fun to talk to people. Uh, I want to I want to give you uh, my perspective on Darwin, and uh, and some developments that would really have pleased Darwin, and developments that I have largely seen since I have been uh, a professional in this field. Uh, so that's that's the main message I'm going to give tonight, and uh, it'll take me a little while to develop that. We're starting here in uh, in the Galapagos. And the Galapagos has about a thousand islands and spires and mounts and, and so on that uh, project above the, the sea. Um, this is this is the island of Darwin, and this is Darwin's arch. Darwin never saw them. Uh, he didn't get to that part of the, the Galapagos. And uh, so he did not see the island named after him. Uh, he did come in the HMS Beagle. It was his trip around the world. And he spent uh, quite a few years going around the world, studying natural history as he went, and getting a lot of impressions. The Galapagos was particularly important in uh, giving him the ideas that geographic isolation led to differentiation of forms and ultimately to new species. Uh, he didn't get to see this, and it's really a shame. Uh, I spent uh, eight, eight days scuba diving in the, in the Galapagos, and it's a fantastic place to be. It's still a wilderness, uh, and uh, that, that arch is bigger than you would you'd think it was from that first picture. Here's a few of us who are getting ready to go on a, uh, to go down. And uh, now if we go back, <coughs> oh, Dave. there we go, okay. Uh, if we go back, this is 40 feet tall, so you can make an estimate of what that's like. There is no place to get on board, uh, on, on shore. There are uh, no beaches, no soft landings. Uh, you, you can't do it. Here's a map of where we're going tonight. One is going to be previous notions of uh, selection, particularly Darwin's, and the speed of adaptation and the time needed for speciation. That'll be one. Then I'm going to tell you some things about, I'm going to focus on cases of natural selection that are all around here. They're all within the state of Colorado. They've all been uh, looked at recently, and uh, there's some interesting uh, uh, things that have been found. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the mountain pine beetles, and I'll talk to you about adaptation and, and natural selection there. Um, and also the selection that the mountain pine beetles put on the forests that they were killing. Uh, then I'm going to uh, change and go to rock, paper, and scissors played in the desert by side-blotched lizards, and that's out in western Colorado. And then uh, specialization and speciation in red crossbills. Now all of this is on the theme of natural selection and how quickly it might go. Um, and I have, uh, I was reviewing Darwin's Origin of Species uh, for this talk, and I came up with this quote, it's from chapter four, it may be said that the natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world every variation, even the slightest, 
rejecting that which is bad, preserving and adding up all that is good, and said some things. And then he says, we see nothing of these slow changes in progress until the hand of time has marked the long past geological ages. ages. He's referring to fossils there. Uh, that we would only see the forms of life are now different from what they formerly were. So he has the idea that you can see the, uh, the action of natural selection by comparing fossils with the present time. So he's talking about thousands of years. <coughs> now, if you, if you read his book, Origin of Species, you'll see that he knows that his friends, his drinking buddies, who had the hobbies of uh, raising pigeons, they could produce a new variety of pigeons within 20 years. So people working in animal or plant husbandry could produce new forms very, very quickly. But he didn't imagine that that could happen in nature. He thought that everything was happening at the rate that you saw it in the fossil, uh, in the fossil uh, history. And so um, that's what I'm talking about tonight. So we'll start off with a question. That's the, uh, the Flatirons by Boulder. And here's a pop quiz for you. What most of the trees that you see there are ponderosa pine. How long have ponderosa pine been in the mountains? 8,000 years. 8,000 years? 100 years. Millions of years. Hundreds of millions of years. Okay. End of the last ice age. So, well, uh, Julio Betancourt and Steve Jackson know uh, because they, uh, uh, Julio studies. Uh, pack rat middens. Pack rats are, uh, they're rodents, and they have this odd habit of just picking things up. Uh, sometimes it's a, uh, a pine needle, uh, a cactus spine, uh, a bud that has fallen off a plant. They take it back to their den, they pee on it, I don't know why, <laughs> uh, and uh, over time, the, the things that they have piled up in there, that midden, uh, uh, becomes indurated or uh, encased in a, a brown solid that keeps oxygen from getting to them. And so plant tissues can be saved for 40,000 years that way. Julio comes along, finds these middens sometimes 30 feet deep, and he cuts them apart, takes them home, does uh, uh, carbon dating on them, and then he says, oh, well, this is a ponderosa pine needle. Uh, this is a uh, something or other cactus uh, spine. And so he puts together past communities from the pack rat middens. And in this particular map, what they have done is shown how Ponderosa Pine came back after the last glaciers. They were, 14,000 years ago, on the uh, mountain islands down in Arizona and New Mexico. Around 10,000 years ago, they were getting into Colorado. They got to Boulder 5,100 years ago. They were almost building the, uh, the pyramids by then. They got up to the Bighorn Mountains 1,000 years ago. Uh, Leif Erikson was landing uh, in Nova Scotia at that time. Um, then they got up into this portion of uh, Montana only a thousand years ago. So they are recent. Now, uh, so there is the map. That's the timeline. And what I want to tell you about is that forest biologists have known for some time that there are some severe limitations to, uh, to how you can do reforestation. And for the first 20 or 30 years that they tried to reforest, forest biologists had a terrible time. They would often, sometimes it would work, but sometimes they would collect seeds, plant them out, and there would be a total failure. So they realized sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And for 100 years, they put together common garden studies to understand that, and they came to the conclusion that the ponderosa pine the Douglas fir, the Engelmann spruce, um, and all, virtually all of the western conifers are uh, exquisitely adapted to the environments in which they live. 
Now here's a here's a ponderosa pine invading the Great Plains south of Boulder, and here are ponderosa pine up in Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, this one's at 5,500 feet. Uh, this one's at 8,500 feet. And the point I want to make is, if you took seeds from that first tree and brought them up here and planted them and cared for them and hoped that someday you could cut them down and make lumber out of them, it would be a futile effort. There is no point in doing that. The ones that are down on the grassland are adapted to that environment. If you took these seeds and put them down low, nothing would happen. And so they, they created something called seed zones. And basically the Forest Service will tell you that they have a rule of thumb. You can't take seeds and move them 300 meters, which is about 900 feet. You can't move them 900 feet higher up or 900 feet further down and ever expect to harvest anything. It will, it'll be a total failure. And so they, they set these own rules up and they live by those rules. <clears throat> so it's ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, lodgepole pine, Engelman spruce, western white pine, western hum hemlock, all the big forest mm -hmm. trees behave the same way. You can't move that seed higher or lower. Now let's think about that. The, uh, the ponderosa pine just got to boulder 5,000 years ago. And yet now they're adapted to such a degree that you can't take seed from 5,500 and put it at 6,500 and expect it to live. An adaptation has formed so that they are exquisitely zoned up and down the mountains. And that's the way for all of these trees. Uh, and these are uh, these are very sensible biologists that will tell you you can't do that. Uh, these trees have adaptations. If you think about it, all of that adaptation happened in the last 5,000 years. Actually, less than 5,000 years, because it probably took them 1,000 years to get up to, they're up to 10,000 feet now. If you think about it, they, uh, the very same thing is seen in the Bighorn Mountains, and the trees there have only been there a thousand years. Now one of the things I put down here is, I've estimated that a uh, generation for ponderosa pine is between 30 and 50 years. Let's take 50. 50 into 5,000, that's 100 generations. 50 into 1,000, that's 20 generations. So in only 20 generations in the Bighorn Mountains, these trees have become adapted to the plains, adapted to the very high mountains. And this is not something that took thousands or millions of years. It took 20 generations up in the Bighorn Mountains. That's very, very fast. Let's go to another one. Another one that was around uh, and down on the plains was limber pine. And here's a Clark's Nutcracker. Clark's Nutcracker uh, spreads the seeds of limber pine, and so they, they are mutualists with the pine. Uh, you can see that uh, the bird has a, a seed in its mouth. It's going to collect 30,000 seeds per year. Uh, it caches them in small groups of two to five. It, it punches a hole in the, in the ground, it plants them, and then it goes on. They can carry about 50 seeds in a sublingual or beneath the tongue pouch. And so, uh, they're doing uh, a service for the trees, and the trees uh, let them take the seeds. They actually, they hold their, their cones horizontal instead of pendant so that they're landing platforms. They don't drop their seeds. They don't open completely up, so the seeds are there when, they, when the birds get there. The seeds are very much larger than the other pines. The seeds don't have uh, wings on them, so there have been adjustments to this mutualism from both sides. What I want to show you is there is a very similar uh, range of adaptation uh, in limber pine. That's Pawnee Buttes uh, out in, uh, on the plains in Colorado, just about where Nebraska, Wyoming, and Colorado meet. So there are, tr uh, there are trees out there that have been there for a very long time. And yet, uh, this is just about 5,000 feet. Now let's go up into the mountains. This is 11,000 feet, 
And uh, these are big trees. Here's a, a big tree here. You can see this is all one crown, one tree. And this is at our mountain research station. Uh, we're looking out toward Pikes Peak is uh, 60 miles away. And uh, up here at tree line at 11,200 feet, a mile above the uh, Pawnee Buttes, you have the same species. That's an extraordinary range. This is a tree on Black Mountain. It's at the southern edge of uh, South Park. And this tree is 21 or 22 feet in circumference. It's an enormous tree, but it's only about 30 feet tall. Uh, my guess is that it's very, very old. It's been hit, hit by lightning three different times. It's surviving. It's in good health. And it'll keep going a long time. Here's another one. This is at the ancient Limber Pine site above Fair Play on Sheep Mountain. And uh, this particular tree, the Forest Service asked me to go up and core these trees to find out how old they were. They had already labeled it as ancient. And sure enough, uh, the trees look different. This is much bigger around than I am. The tree is only about 25 feet tall. And when we cored that tree and found its age, it, this tree is 1,544 years old. And there are other trees nearly twice that diameter on the same site. Limber pine gets rotten in the middle, and so it won't let you age the very biggest trees. By extrapolation, though, with diameter and age, uh, I was, uh, I've come to the conclusion that the very big trees on that site are about 3,000 years old. But I can't prove it because the, the centers are rotten. What I can say is that tree, which is only 0.8 meters in diameter, the, bigger, the big ones are 1 1.4. This one's 1,500 years old. Wow. Now, there's a type of mitochondrial DNA that I have found up in the mountains. And when you look at where that mitochondrial DNA is on a map, it looks like a snake going through Colorado. And then you look at the map carefully and you say, oh, that's the Continental Divide. That, uh, that type of mitochondrial DNA is only found high. So then I've, we've explored it for several years. That type of mitochondrial DNA is from Levita Pass up to Independence Pass. But it never gets below 10,000 feet. And I thought, well, I wonder if this is adaptation to high elevations. Now, these trees were out on the plains when the... Uh, when uh, the glaciers were uh, at their, their highest. So they have climbed the mountains and then uh, now they have this adaptation which cannot, will not allow them to get below 10,000 feet. Uh, we've shown that the respiration rates of the mitochondrial DNA very high and in lower places is distinctly different, significantly different. And um, I set about to test whether these high elevation forms could live at lower elevations by setting up a common garden. As I was setting up a common garden on campus, I was walking some seedlings across this lawn and I kicked, I was carrying a tray full of trees, uh, little bitty seedlings, and I kicked a cone and I thought, that's a limber cone. And uh, the people who were uh, decorating the campus in 1932, the CCC, uh, planted trees on the Boulder campus from Pikes Peak. So I talked to a historian and she said, yes, it, it was the CCC, the trees came from Pikes Peak, and I thought uh, it might have both the high and the low form of the mitochondrial DNA. I ran around campus, I found 11 trees, they had planted a common garden for me. Ten of the trees are the low elevation form. And here are four, three of them. One, two, three. They're very tall. They litter the lawn with, uh, with cones, and they fill the air with pollen. That's the low elevation form of the mitochondrial DNA. I found one tree that was the high elevation form. It's growing in the same environment. It's this. <coughs> now, that's the same environment. It's only 20 feet away. Uh, 
and this tree is truly, truly pathetic. <laughs> I've had to come to its rescue four different times because the physical plant will put a yellow ribbon around it, and that means cut this sucker down. <laughs> and so then I, I call him up and I say, no, 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 please don't. I take the trees out there, and this is a, an example of adaptation to high elevations and the simple uh, demonstration that this tree can't make it down here. If this was not on a watered lawn, it would have died long ago. It cannot produce any seeds or any pollen. So in an evolutionary sense, it isn't even there now, even though it's living. <laughs> so once again, limber pine has shown us a type of elevation, elevational adaptation that must have been developed in the last 5,000 years. And how many generations is that when the trees live 1,500 years? It's just a few generations. <coughs> Selection has happened very quickly to shape that forest as you go up and down the mountains. Okay, well here's somebody else that shaped the forest for us. This is the mountain pine beetle. And uh, I have chased this one uh, a number of, of years. There was an epidemic in 1979 to 1981, and then we just had a, another epidemic. And uh, this, this beetle uh, is one of the many insects that has <coughs> responded to climate change. We have, uh, at our mountain station, we have long-term um, recordings of temperature and, and all sorts of other things. And my graduate student, Scott Ferenberg, uh, put together these data to say if we look at the temperatures in springtime that a beetle can use for development which is that's above five degrees centigrade and we calculate the number of degree de growing degree days and then plot it over time the data go back to 1953 you see that it has changed substantially and one way of looking at this says that the number of degree days at 10,000 feet has increased by 58% in the last four decades. It's not a trivial amount, it's an enormous amount. <clears throat> well, uh, we know that the, the, uh, the mountain pine beetle has done some remarkable things. In the 1970s and 1980s, the Forest Service that was watching the mountain pine beetle had places to look for them and, and so on, and they only looked up to 9,000 feet because the beetle didn't kill any trees above 9,000 feet. That was its upper elevational limit. But the temperatures have risen, and since 1975, or maybe the 80s, those trees, the, the beetles, have climbed 2,000 feet in our own mountains. They've climbed 400 miles further north in Canada than they've ever been before. And this is all since 1975 or 1985. It's been a quick change. <clears throat> Scott and I looked at bark beetles that now seem to be doing something very odd. We were up there in June. We found them lying, uh, landing on our shirts before they went into the trees. We commented on that to the Forest Service and the Forest Service said, that's not possible. And, and I said, what, what's not possible? <laughs> and they said, um, the beetle does not fly until August. And I said, no, this was June. And they said, well, it wasn't a mountain pine beetle. And, and I've had uh, four, four students get doctoral degrees on mountain pine beetles. And I edited a book on mountain pine beetles. And I said, they weren't grasshoppers, and they weren't butterflies. They were mountain pine beetles. And they said, you are mistaken. And um, I reacted in a, in a, a childish way. <laughs> We're not above that. Uh, and so I, I figured, I'll get the proof. And so for four years, we, we watched individual trees. We, we, uh, we put lures on them. We got the beetles to hit the trees. And then we would watch, week by week, what's happening in this tree. Cut a little bark. Are they eggs now? Are they larvae? Are there, uh, and, and so on. And what we found was, historically, beetles would fly in the last days of July, first two weeks of August. They'd lay eggs in, an, in a day or so after getting into a tree, and then larvae would take until the next July or August. 
to develop into adults. One year. But now, instead of coming out in late July or August, they're coming out in May or June. Mm -hmm. And from May to August, they become adults and lay eggs. This is a summer generation that has never been documented. And people have been watching mountain pine beetles for a hundred years. This has never happened before. And when we told people about this, they said, that's not possible. So then we'd say, come here, let, 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 show it. come to our sites, we'll show you. As a matter of fact, look at your sites. Because if you look the way we do, uh, you will see that this is happening at your site as well. And, and the observations of that have trickled in. So what we have found is, they start now in May or June, there are adults um, uh, that are coming out uh, and then they lay eggs. This is, I'm sorry, this is the new summer generation. And this is timed with the old one. There's eggs in September and around again. We found that not all beetles were doing this. Some were and some were not. For those that were, they were getting in two generations per year. They lay about 60 eggs. And let's just say that 30 of the 60 eggs turn into adults. Half of them die. So in the old way of doing it, mom could have 60 offspring in one year. In the new way of doing it, mom has 60 offspring in two months. And then they go off, and each one of those finds a mate. And 60 times 60 is now 3,600. So this mom instead of getting 60 in a year, it gets 3,660 grandchildren in a year. That's an exponential increase in the number, I just used 60 instead of 30, but I think you get the point. There is an exponential increase in the number of beetles. That's an exponential increase in the number of trees that are attacked. And that is why we just had an epidemic that lasted 12 to 15 years it's unlike any that has ever been seen before, uh, greater than 10 times the second biggest one, and it went all the way from New Mexico to within a few miles of Alaska. It was just enormous, and from the Front Range here to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and this was just one of the responses to climate change, and this popped it up within a few years. So temperatures got warm enough, they get pushed over a threshold, and then this advantage of being able to, to reproduce twice in a year was such a strong advantage that it swept through the population. Natural selection acted very quickly, and one of the things that to remember is this was a very visible response to selection, but there were hundreds of other insects that responded in the same way butterflies or um, um, bumblebees, uh, grasshoppers, but none of them had the impact on the landscape that brought it to you visually, like what this was. And so, for example, um, uh, this is the William Forks Mountains, and you can see the gray of all the lodgepole pines that have been killed there and there. And in places, 90% of the trees in a vista are, have been taken. And one of the things, and look at this. Uh, here are beetle kill trees that extend here, then they come down here, then they go here, then they go here, and you can follow dead trees from Dillon to the Wyoming border. It's been an amazing uh, impact, and even worse, up in Vancouver. Now, we've learned some things from the beetle, and the beetle has also had a major impact on the forests. Okay, I just told you this. Uh, <laughs> that uh, it, It's the longer growing season which allowed the beetle to put on a second generation in a year. A major response. But now, the beetle has had a response. And this, this picture reminds me to tell you that the only response that a tree has to a beetle boring into it is resin. That's the only defense. 
And what it will try to do is put enough resin into the hole that this female is digging so that she is physically swept out. And if she isn't physically swept out, then perhaps she'll become mired in that and then it'll dry and, and she'll die in there. So this is the only thing that they can do to beetles. If they've got a whole lot of water uh, available to them, they can put out an enormous amount and they can kill the beetles that are trying to kill them. If they have a low amount of water, they can't put out much resin and then they become susceptible. And then there's a, a range in between. <clears throat> but not all trees are the same. Just like not all beetles are the same, not all humans are the same. And you can, you can get a metric of how much energy a tree puts into defense by counting these little dots. These are the resin canals that store the resin that the beetle interrupts when it digs that, uh, that egg gallery. These are the things that hold sap. So at, at one time the tree bark was here and the beetle would have come in and interrupted these and that's what releases the resin. This is a permanent record of the effort put out year by year by that tree. Now, uh, Kane and Kolb, looking in Arizona, uh, saw that the beetles were coming. They were on a big experimental forest with big ponderosa pine. They said, well, we know we're going to get hit. How can we take advantage of this? And they said, I know, let's watch to see which trees get hit and which trees don't. And what they found out was that a number of the trees were passed over. The, the beetles didn't want to attack them, but they would attack the tree next to it. And then they, when all was said and done and the attacked trees were dead, they went and they cored them and they found out that the beetles had passed over the trees with high levels of resin canals. They didn't want them. They went into the trees that had low levels of resin, low, low resin responses, and so they were able to kill those trees. And uh, Scott and I, uh, we, knew, we knew Cain, uh, and uh, we thought, this is fascinating. And I was up in Rocky Mountain National Park and noticed I'm on the Beerstadt Trail, I'm looking towards Long's Peak. There's red trees in there intermixed with green. Now that may be that the beetles have attacked some trees because they had low levels of resin, or it may be that they attacked a whole lot of them, and some of them died, and some of them killed the beetles. So Scott and I did an experiment. Let, let's, Kane and Kolb have said, we now know what the beetles like to hit. Now let's ask, who can they kill? So what we did was we were two different species up at our mountain station. We got about a hundred trees, all of them being mass attacked. We watched for a year, and those that died, we called susceptible, and those that killed the beetles and lived, we called those resistant. This is the number of resin canals in the trees that killed the beetles, in the trees that died they're significantly different. More resin canals in the beetle in the trees that survived. That's lodgepole pine, here's limber pine, the trees that survived, the trees that died. And so now when you put the, together this, uh, the, the choice of the tree that the beetle makes, I want to go after the ones that have the lowest defenses, they only attack those with the lowest. And then of the, all of those that attack, there are not, the, not successful attacks in the trees with high. And so the forest is being cleaned of trees with low levels of defenses. And what they're leaving is a forest that has uh, a, high, a high number of resin canals, high defenses. So we have a much better forest now than we did before. <laughs> Are the beetles evolving too to to attack uh, more effectively the the more high resin? I'm certain they are. I am certain they are. <laughs> uh, the beetles have been here, by the way, 34 million years in Western forests. So the, this the, the beetles go way back. So this this dance has been going on for a long time. Wow. So they even predate the ponderosa pine. Yeah. Sure. 
but at least some sort of bark beetles have been found uh, in Colorado. So, uh, and you're right, ponderosa pine only goes back about 25 million. Well, you know, you just said that in the beginning of your talk, didn't you say that? Uh, so those conifers well, have only been here. That was just here. Five, that, that was, was just, just here. here. Okay. They, they've been down in Mexico, down in Texas, and then they're then they're back up, and then they're back down again, and. Okay, uh, here's a cute little story. I'm going to make this one short. This is called the, uh, the Jagged Ambush bug. bug. You have to look carefully. It's right in front of you, but you do have to look carefully. Here's the male. Here's his eye. There's his antenna. He's here. He's clutching a female. Uh, and there's her eye. There's her antenna. And she is very yellow, and he is very black. And so uh, some people have looked into that and asked, why is that? Why is it that a male is different colors than the females? And the, of course, the first reaction was, it must be because she wants a darker male. And so they did trials, and they offered her light males and dark males. That wasn't it at all. She didn't care. As a matter of fact, she didn't get a whole lot of choice. Uh, in the morning, uh, males would be out wandering around, and if a female was available, they would latch onto her and hold onto her until she was ready to mate. It turns out that what this is, is uh, males run the whole gamut from being fairly light to fairly dark, but it's only the dark ones that get to mate. And the difference is that the dark ones pick up more energy from the early sun just like a, a dark car gets hotter in wintertime, the dark males pick up more energy. They're able to start moving around. They're hunting for females earlier in the morning. And so uh, it's just a matter of who finds them first, but dark is able to get started early in the morning. And so again and again, each and every generation, it's the dark males that have repro reproductive success. Wow. But that happens each and every year, each and every generation. Do you have any records of the frequency of dark versus light males, and if that's changed over time? Uh, I did not do this study, uh, and uh, I have, I'd have to look. Uh, here's here's another one, and this is this is one that I think is a real eye opener. You can see this one in Western Colorado and in Utah. Uh, this is Utah Stansburyana. It's a side-blotched lizard. This is the best picture I could get. The real business is in the males, the, uh, the, the throat comes in three different colors. And it's a single gene, and they either have a blue throat, an orange throat, or a yellow throat. It's all single gene. And it's interesting because they have different strategies. The, uh, so here we go, uh, the, it's the dewlaps that are, have the different colors, and they ha they're associated with mating strategies. Their behaviors are tied to them. Their testosterone levels are even tied to them, with testosterone highest in orange, then in blue, then in yellow. Blue is submissive. They're very good at defending territories, but they're submissive to orange. Orange has the highest levels of testosterone. The orange can come into a blue's territory bully him, they always win, they take his females and mate with them, and then they go back to their own females. So when blues are common, the oranges nearby have not only their own females, but the, 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 those <coughs> protected by blues, and so the orange do very well. Orange is very aggressive, but always off its territory looking for somebody else's females. <laughs> and yellow, which has the lowest level of testosterone, does not defend territories or females, is a sneaker. <laughs> and it knows that the orange is out, uh, it, it is out dating, and uh, the yellow sneaks in and does a very good job uh, copulating with the orange's females. <laughs> Um, the, the yellow is not very successful with the blues females because uh, the blue is a good husband, stays home, protects his females, and the yellow can't get anything uh, <laughs> of the blue territory. 
what happens here is, and here's what's so important to me about this. When I was an early graduate student in 1969 through 1973, I was told that the differences in selection coefficients were between 1% and 1 tenth of 1%. If selection happened, if natural selection could be measured in a, in a population, the reproductive advantage of one form over another would be at most 1%, at most. But this study, which is very well documented, says blue is replaced by orange. Orange is replaced by yellow. Yellow is replaced by blue. And that whole cycle takes 12 years. And then it does it again and again and again. No one strategy, just like rock, paper, scissors, no one is best. They cycle, and when blue is becoming more common, it is putting out four times, uh, it's four times, which is 400%, times uh, the, uh, the reproductive output of the other forms. And so these cycle in the desert with remarkable differences in reproductive output, not 1%, 400%. And so this is a very fast cycle that occurs out in the deserts. Darwin would not have, he would have been stunned because he just didn't imagine that this could possibly happen. Would, would that have an effect on the rate that those creatures evolve? Wouldn't that well, put a damper on Well, in fact, they, that is evolution. Evolution is a genetic change in a population and it's going through the same cycle again and again and again. Now, of course, there's, there's other sorts of evolutionary responses sure. to changing temperature and parasites and things like that. But at least the one that is so visible is going very fast. Okay. Um, this is the last one, last one. Uh, uh, this is a red crossbill. And this is a, one of the crossbills that goes after ponderosa pine. And there's his mate. The crossbills have indeed crossed bills. And they can put the, the tips together. They insert them into a cone. They put them between the uh, cone scales. Then they close down their beak. These two things pry the scales apart. The tongue goes in there, grabs the seed, and pulls it all out. And that takes about 1.4 seconds. So they can get a seed out of a cone much faster than you or I could. <coughs> the neat thing is that these follow the trees up from the, uh, up from the south. And so these have been around in the west and up to Montana for about 15,000 years. Now here's the, uh, the same species, but this is on pinion. And when you compare the bird on ponderosa to those on pinion, you say, you know, they're, they're not quite the same, are they? The beak is not the same, the color is not the same, the size is not the same. And then you realize by doing studies, gee, they mate at slightly different times in different areas. The ones on pinion don't have access to those on ponderosa. And those on ponderosa don't have access to those on lodgepole. And those are somewhat separated by elevation and geography from those on Douglas fir. And so, in fact, each one of these is recognizably different. The specialist that has a different beak shape and size on Douglas fir, ponderosa, and pinion. They're easy to tell apart if you study these birds. <clears throat> and the one in lodgepole, the one working with uh, in populations with squirrels. However, uh, they're, they're, they're distinct enough so that some of these mating, some of the calls are different now. So they're mating at different times on different substrates with different mating calls. This one, it's in the South Hills of uh, Idaho, and uh, that one has very different sized cones because uh, unlike all the others, there are no pine squirrels there. Pine squirrels influence the shape of the cones. Without the pine squirrels, the cone shapes, they're bigger, they're more heavily armored, the birds have to be bigger. And so now this one has a different species name. This happened only in the last five years. And so uh, some of the early data was coming in, out on this. 
but this has just been declared a different species. Mm. Now, in fact, if you get the whole story from Craig Benkman, who's, been, who's made his life studying this, <clears throat> all of this has happened since the trees swept north. All of this differentiation, the specialist on this, the specialist on this, the specialist on this, and this new species has all occurred in the last 15,000 years at most, maybe less than 5,000 years, but maybe less than that. How long did it actually take for that separation and then the genetic differentiation, the adaptation to a different cone to work with? And so now that we're looking more carefully, we're finding more and more cases where natural selection is occurring not over millions of years, not over many thousands of years, but we know it must have started at least back there. It's happened by now. So we'll say within the last 15,000 years, but maybe it was within 500 years. We're not sure. All we know is it's happening very fast, and for some species we can see it's racing out there like rock, paper, and scissors. <clears throat> and so I could have brought other studies. Uh, these are ones that I know about either because a friend did them uh, or I did them. Uh, and this story could be told again and again and again. We now appreciate even much more than we did when I started as a graduate student that natural selection can change things in a few years. Darwin's friends, his drinking buddies, could produce a new strain of pigeons in 20 years. But they didn't believe that anything like that could happen in nature. And now we know it can. It can happen just that quickly. Climate change is producing enormous changes in birds, mammals, plants, and insects. <coughs> And it's all happening very quickly. So Darwin would be very pleased that, his, that the, uh, the mechanism that he discovered at the same time as Wallace uh, is not only around us, we can not only see the remnants of it happening, that it has happened, but we can watch it happening today. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the end, and what I'm going to do is, I hope there will be a little discussion here, and so what I'm going to do to keep you awake is, uh, I brought some pictures of the uh, Galapagos, and so uh, I'll flip and uh, I'll make a comment maybe every once in a while when that pops up. But before that, let's give Jeff a